Hi everyone, hope you're doing fine. Welcome to this channel. My name is Jesper and in this video I'm going to be talking about the routine assessment of a newborn and initial care of the infant. We're also going to go through high yield topics such as the APGAR score and how it works. When the newborn arrives we will have various tasks and responsibilities that we need to do. And let's talk about it more general at first and then go into more details later. So we should quickly evaluate the physiological adjustment of the newborn from being inside the uterus to then being outside. And if necessary, we need to help with this adjustment because there's a lot of physiological adaptation that needs to take place. We also need to assess potential birth trauma. And for the assessment in general, it is good to do it in an approach from head to toe. So anatomically in a descending order so from the head to the toe, up to down, because we don't want to miss anything. Now let's quickly summarize the APGAR score and talk about what it is and why it's important. So the APGAR score is a method of assessing how the newborn is adapting to the outside environment. It is sort of a way of observing certain features of the baby and then giving points. The maximum point and the best is 10 and the least point, so the worst score, is 0. The more points, the healthier the baby seems to us essentially. The APGAR score is determined at minute 1, 5 and 10, so 3 times in the first 10 minutes. APGAR has 5 letters and each of these respective letters will be indicative of a feature that we observe. And each letter will give points. So one letter can give either zero points, one point, or two points. And that's why we have five letters, and then if all of those five gives two points, then the maximum score is 10. I will now quickly mention each letter and what the letter stands for and how we grade it. So the first A, is for appearance. So basically appearance as in how does the newborn look? How does the skin look? Does it look like it's getting blood and oxygen? Or does it look like it's cyanotic, so either pale or bluish? We know that cyanotic means that the blood is not properly oxygenating and if the skin looks fine without any cyanosis we would give two points and then if the skin looks not perfect, so a little bit cyanotic, then we give one point. And then if the skin looks very pale or blue, we give zero points. P is for pulse. And newborns and infants have a higher pulse than adults. If it's over 100, that's good and equals two points. 60 to 100 is one point and less than 60 is zero. G stands for grimace. This one refers to reflex irritability, meaning it assesses the reaction of the newborn to some stimulus made from the doctor to that newborn. The stimulus could be different things. It could be a pinch or a stimuli such as suctioning of the mouth or nose with a syringe, which sometimes is necessary. And if the baby do not show any grimacing or response, then there is no grimacing, that's zero points. If the baby reacts slightly and slightly grimaces but not, does not cough or cry, that is one. And if it properly cries, sneezes or coughs, then we assign two points. For me, this one was kind of tricky to remember since G grimace maybe is a bit misleading. But for me, thinking G for grimace, G for giggling helped me remember. And I think of giggling as in laughing if being tickled. If, if you're giggling because being tickled, then you're having a response to some kind of stimuli. Just like the baby would grimace when some stimuli would be applied. So G for grimace, G for giggling. At least it was a memory rule for me and maybe it will help you. All right, so moving on. So the next A is for activity. So remember there was two A's in the APGAR. First one was for appearance and now we're on the A for activity. So this one refers to the muscle activity or muscle tone and we give then zero points if the muscles are loose and floppy and then we give one if there's only a bit of resistance or a little bit of muscle tone and then two points 
will be given if there is proper active motion of the muscles of the baby. R is for respiration, so in essence breathing. And if the infant is not breathing, we give zero. If the infant breathes, but slowly or irregularly, it's one point. And then two point is given if the baby breathes good and regularly. Often crying is also a good indicator for proper breathing. In the next step of the assessment, so now we're done with APGAR score, we will determine a few numbers. It might seem like a lot at first, but it's probably good to memorize a few of them. So first of all, the length. The healthy baby is born with a total body length of 49 to 53 centimeter when it's born at term. After that, we also determine the weight of the baby. A baby with less than 2,500 gram, so two and a half kilo, is below the 10th percentile and is seen as too small for its gestational age. A baby over 4,000 grams, so a baby over four kilo, is considered big. And we refer to this as macrosomic because it's too large for the gestational age. Important to keep in mind is also that the babies initially lose around 10% of their birth weight at first, but within the first two weeks of life, this weight should be regained with proper feeding. We also measure head and chest circumference, and the average head will have a circumference of 33 to 38 centimeter, and a chest circumference of a little bit less, so around 31 to 36 centimeter. So after checking the size and different measurements of the newborn, we will proceed to more functional tests. Here it's important to measure the temperature. A normal axillary temperature should be around 36 to 37 degrees, so pretty much the temperature is the same for newborns as for adults as well. After that, we auscultate the heart. So, of course, we also quickly auscultate the heart in the APGAR score to see if there is pulse, but now we auscultate it to check for any potential murmurs or heart sounds, so more detailed. When we put our stethoscope on the chest of a baby, we will also hear the lungs filling with air. The normal respiratory rate is around double as high for a baby as it is for adults with a normal range of 30 to 60 breaths per minute. We also hear for abnormal sounds, for example, wheezing or rails. When we have a look at the chest, we can see if there's any abnormal moving of the thoracic wall or if it seems symmetrical. As we said earlier, we will measure the circumference of the head. But with that, we are not finished with the assessment of a newborn. We also feel gently for the fontanelles, which are the two openings in the skull that are not yet closed at birth. There is an anterior fontanelle and a smaller posterior fontanelle. The anterior fontanelle is the bigger one, and it needs around 18 months to close. And the posterior one, which is slightly smaller and triangular in shape, closes usually at around 8 to 12 weeks of life, but can also close earlier. When at birth the fontanelles appear sunken, it indicates that the baby might be dehydrated, while a bulging out of a fontanelle indicates that the newborn might have a raised intracranial pressure, so this might be a red flag. Also important to note is that the head will not have the same shape right after birth as an adult head. The bones in a newborn baby are not yet properly fused. The head can be squeezed together so that the bones overlap. This squeezing is called molding and occurs physiologically during the passage through the birth canal. And this change in shape usually resolves within one or two days after birth. We also want to have a look at the baby's face and check if there are any asymmetries in the eyes, the nose, the lips, the mouth, or the ears. We also want to make sure that all axes of symmetry are in the right places. So that the midline and septum of the nose are in the midline of the nares, 
the ears are aligned with the outer contus of the eye and that the auditory canal is open. This is important for the detection of chromosomal abnormalities. So after we have inspected the head, we will continue with the neck. Here we will check that the shape is normally short and with deep folds of the skin. A webbing of the neck is typically associated with certain syndromes such as Down's syndrome or trisomy 21. We also want to check if the neck has the full range of motion and that the trachea is positioned in the center of the neck. After that, we feel with the tips of the fingers for any abnormal masses. This concludes the inspection then of the neck and we can proceed further to the chest. The first point of the inspection of the chest is to inspect its shape. It should be formed cylindrical. A more bell-shaped form can be a sign for underdeveloped lungs. Also, we should check the position and in integrity of the clavicles and ribs. They might have gotten damaged during birth. We also can observe the movement of the lungs and respiratory muscles. When we examine the lungs and heart, we also auscultate the lungs and the heart to check for any abnormal sounds, such as murmurs, as we said. When proceeding further distally, we reach the abdomen. Here we check once again for a cylindrical shape as well. We evaluate the bowel sounds. A flattened abdomen can indicate a diaphragmatic hernia. After the inspection of the abdomen follows the ex examination of the male or female genitals and the confirmation that the anus is patent. Now follows the inspection of the extremities. This is important as a fracture to the clavicle or dislocation of various joints may occur during birth. We assess for full range of motion, symmetry and signs of trauma. Also the muscle tone should be checked for. A hyperflexibility of the joints is considered a sign for syndromes such as Down's syndrome. Also it should not be forgotten to count the digits, so the fingers on the extremities as a fusion called syndactyly or more than five digits called polydactyly may sometimes be present. In the next part we evaluate the spine, the last body part left. Here we want to make sure that the spine is straight and has its normal curvature. We also have to make sure that the shoulders, scapula and iliac crests are aligned as this can indicate an abnormal curvature of the spinal column. A dimpling of the skin over the spine is associated with spina bifida. The last part of our examination is the assessment of the skin, its color, texture and turgor. The turgor of the skin describes its elasticity and decrease in turgor can indicate dehydration. After assessing all the body parts, we proceed with a neurological examination. This includes the physiological reflexes for newborns. We will talk about those reflexes in detail in a separate video. We also want to make sure that the newborn is alert and responsive to stimuli. So with this we conclude the assessment of the newborn. Other important steps of the first assessment and care of the newborn include to apply the cord clamp to the umbilical cord and also obtaining footprints as well as identification bands. The identification bands are placed on the newborn's ankle and or wrist and the band usually contains information to the baby, for example its full name, its gender and the date when it was born, as well as the hospital bed in which it stays during its time in the hospital. The footprints are made as a way of identification, similar to fingerprints. The foot is usually used rather than the finger as it is easier to make a print of them in newborns as newborns often move a lot and curl their hands and tiny fingers and we want to upset them as little as possible. After these steps we will administer the vitamin K and I prophylaxis. This is important. Newborns are usually born with very small amounts of vitamin K in their blood and this can lead to vitamin K deficiency bleeding. We know that vitamin K is important for coagulation. 
Also breast milk is generally low in vitamin K and therefore the baby has to get it supplemented somehow. The eye prophylaxis for a newborn is given to all newborns. It is an ointment that is applied within the first hour of life. And this ointment contains erythromycin, which is a type of a macrolide antibiotic. And this macrolide antibiotic works against Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a sexually transmitted infection that can be transmitted to the newborn during birth if the mother is infected with the bacteria. So it's done prophylactically, not only if the mom is proven to be positive with the bacteria. If the ointment is not applied and the newborn has gotten the bacteria during birth, it could lead to conjunctivitis, which shows as redness of the eyes, swelling of the eyelids and a pus formation in the eyes. And if left untreated, it can lead to irreparable damage to the eyes and even blindness. It's called ophthalmia neonatorum. At last, when the examination is completed, bonding between the parents and the newborn completes the first step of the newborn's life. Typically, this bonding occurs by a skin-to-skin -skin contact between the baby and the mother and also the father. So this was a lot in this video and we will go into more details of, for example, the neurological examination in another video. Thank you so much for watching the whole video. I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel, please subscribe. It's free and it really helps us. Thank you very much. See you in the next video.